So yeah, it's a great honor to have uh, Dave uh, Renzen here with us. Uh, Dave is a technical advisor to the Alphabet uh, CFO, uh, which is the Google, uh, you know, he works for Google. Uh, Dave happened to be uh, the original creator of customer reliability engineering. And also he's been deeply involved, uh, you know, with uh, basically leading Google's global network capacity planning, as well as serving in variety of strategic roles. Uh, for Google's uh, site reliability engineering. And we thought, uh, who better than Dave uh, to, to kick off uh, today's session, uh, which is kind of a new theme, as you, as you all know. Uh, we, we've started the, uh, you know, this year, we introduced the uh, chaos engineering, or as some people prefer calling it, a reliability engineering uh, theme. And uh, having Dave with us to kickstart the day, uh, with this uh, really fascinating topic, and I'm very intrigued by your topic. So, uh, you know, without much delay, I want to hand it over to you, Dave. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naresh. Can folks just give me a thumbs up and make sure they can see my slides? Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good evening from California in the United States, everyone. I am Dave Brenson. I'm a senior engineering director at Google. And um, today I want to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, which is how to completely ruin the things you care about in your life by making them perfect. Uh, that may seem a little counterintuitive, so we'll go through this. I'm going to move through these slides kind of quickly. There's a lot of content here, and I want to make sure I leave enough time for questions at the end. Um, here's the basic outline of what I want to talk about. Uh, perfection is unattainable. It just is. Uh, and we'll go through demonstrating that. But we live in a world uh, where we are encouraged to compare ourselves, frankly, and our work to sort of this impossible standard. So today, I want to talk about why chasing that goal in particular will destroy the systems, the companies, the relationships, the lives, frankly, of the people you are supposed to be helping or making better. And why learning to live with mistakes and in fact injecting some imperfection into your day-to-day -day life actually makes things better uh, in the end. Uh, so if there's any takeaway here, uh, it's this. Perfection is your enemy and you should fight it every chance you get. Uh, and the good news is, is I promise, and this is not link bait, uh, that my last slide in this presentation, I will tell you the, the two-sentence secret to happiness and success in your life uh, professionally and personally. And that's not a clickbait headline. I, I mean that for real. So let's start. Um, I was born and raised here in the United States. And so I have a, you know, let's call it a traditional Western education. When I was, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old in school, I was asked to read this poem. We were all assigned this poem. It's called An Essay on Criticism by a British author. His name is Alexander Pope. And it's a really interesting poem uh, because it's one of these uh, pieces, one of these pieces of art or, or work uh, that has this unique property that no one's ever heard of it, but everybody knows it um, because a number of very famous expressions, at least famous expressions in English, come from this poem. Uh, and so some of you will have heard these before, like a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. The idea that we are our most dangerous when we start to learn about a topic. Uh, it's a well-known phenomenon in the world that uh, first year medical students, for example, all think they have all the worst possible diseases because they've learned a little. Uh, about how they work and not enough to experience to understand when they really do or don't have it. Uh, another expression that comes from this poem, which is fairly common in English, is fools rush in where angels dare to tread. The idea here is that the older you get, the better your judgment and wisdom, and you're a little more careful about the things you do because you can evaluate the risks a little better. Uh, but the, probably the most famous saying to come from this poem is to err is human, but to forgive divine. And this is a really important uh, statement, particularly the first part. It is a central feature of being a human being to make mistakes, well-intentioned errors. Uh, and this is what Pope was saying. Um, and by the way, if, if you've ever heard that expression before, usually if I'm talking to a, a large audience um, and I'll ask them who's heard of this expression, and then you talk to them a little bit more, most people think like maybe William Shakespeare or somebody wrote it, but it's not. In fact, now you, you have a probably useless piece of trivia that that expression, Terrace Human, Forgive Divine, actually comes from Alexander Pope. Now that sentiment about humans, uh, a basic facet of humanity is imperfection, is, is making well-intentioned errors, doesn't begin anywhere near Pope. In the Western tradition, 
it goes back at least 2000 years uh, when I got a little older in high school and college and had to read some of the, you know, more famous Western philosophers there, there was Seneca. And he said, errari humanum est, said in errari perseverari diabolicum. Loosely translated means to err is human, errari humanum est, but to persist in error, said in errari perseverari, is diabolical or, or inhumane would be the right way to think of it. And what he meant by that is it is the most natural thing in the world as a human being to make a mistake. But after you've discovered you are making the mistake, to knowingly persist in a condition of error because of, say, pride or ego, how many of us have sort of had the sense that we we're doing the wrong thing but decided not to change what we were doing because we were just sure that if we banged our head against it a little longer, it would get better. Uh, or maybe with laziness, maybe we don't want to do the work to figure out what the right thing is to do. Or sometimes just uh, because we're 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 stuck. We're like a deer in in the headlights. Um, we're we're overwhelmed by how wrong it is, and we're just not. We're very uncertain with what to do next. But anytime you knowingly persist in a condition of error, you are doing something wrong, something unethical, unethical rather, something frankly inhumane. So we might say this: that in fact we embrace our humanity by embracing the fact that we are fallible, that we will make mistakes. In fact, it is maybe the central most characteristic of what it means to be a human being, is to make a well-intentioned mistake. Now, with that in mind, we're going to talk about what that means for reliability and what it means for, for running systems, and in the end, why understanding that, how it leads to sort of the secret to life. Before we dive into all that, I need to define a few terms just because I don't have the advantage of being in front of you sort of live and knowing and having met people beforehand. So I apologize if some of this is new or it's rather, excuse me, some of this is a repeat for some of you. Uh, I'll go through quickly. I'm going to use the word reliability a lot in this conversation. And I understand that that term encompasses a lot of aspects. When we talk about a system, uh, whether it's a computer system or an economic system, being reliable, we might mean availability, meaning is the system there when I need it? Does it answer? Or correctness, when I ask it a question, does it give me the right answer? Or latency, you know, that it, it responds uh, in a reasonable amount of time. Or error rate, you know, how often when I go to use a thing, does it give me an error rather than respond with some response? Uh, all of those are aspects of reliability, and we might mash some of them together as, as we talk with each other. Um, but for the purposes of this conversation, let's use a, a more intuitive definition and just say a system is reliable when it works in the way that our users expect and need. So our computing systems are reliable when it works, when they work, roughly as our users expect. Um, oh, and, and also I'm going to use terms like users and customers and stakeholders, and I'm going to use those roughly interchangeably in this conversation. Don't Don't read too much into that. All right. So uh, I just spent a few minutes telling you that uh, it is the most human thing in the world to make mistakes, right? That is a defining characteristic of what it means to be human, to make a well-intentioned error. Well, I'm also going to, I'm also a Google SRE. Like I really care about reliability a lot. Um, so I'm also going to say this, that the reliability of a system is its most important feature, period. More important than any other feature you can think of. Uh, my logic goes like this. If a system is not reliable, any system, meaning it does not work the way our users expect and need, then they will not trust it. And if they do not trust it, they will not use it where there are alternatives or they'll invent alternatives. And eventually there will be no users of the system. So you will have some system with no users, which means it has a value of zero. Um, and you can see it in all, and I don't just mean computing systems. Um, it's election season here in the United States. So we might even say a system of government works that way too. And by the way, the way you get feedback in a system of government is with a vote. Um, and we see this throughout history. So again, not just in mechanical systems or computer systems, but economic systems and whatever. All right. So reliability is the most important feature. I don't think I'll get a lot of disagreement in this crowd. Some of the things I think you won't disagree with, but we can save it for the Q&A. Um, I'm an SRE which means I am very concerned in a good way. Like it's really important to me to automate away all the things that can be automated. And, but the question is, what are the things that can be automated? What are the things we can give to computers? Well, to answer that question, we have to realize two important things. One, 
humans are terrible machines. We are terrible uh, computers. Never mind the fact that the term computer was actually a job title for people who actually calculated figures by hand. Computers, as we understand them, little boxes that do things repeatedly. Humans are terrible, uh, terrible computers. When I'm in front of a crowd, sometimes if it's large enough, I'll do this experiment like three slides ago. Well, I'll ask you all to raise, say, your left hand, and then I'll take a picture. And roughly at this point in the presentation, I will show you a picture, the, the, the picture that I took. And you will see that in a, a crowd of 100 or 1,000 people, about 20% of the people will have raised the wrong hand, even though everyone in the crowd knows they're left from right. And everyone heard the very simple instruction, raise your left hand. This is because humans are terrible computers. If you ask a human being to do the same task over and over again, about 20% of the time, they're just going to do the wrong thing. That's a little depressing, but it's also a little hopeful because computers are terrible humans, as it turns out, and will always be terrible humans, I think. And it comes down to this, the difference between intuition and judgment. These are two terms that people confuse all the time or they mix up all the time. So for our conversation today, I want to define this. Judgment is what we as people use to make a decision when there is no more useful data to get or no more time to get it. Judgment gets better with experience. Our judgment as adults is better than it was when we were children. And the older we get, the better our judgment will, will become. Intuition is different. Intuition, or gut, let's say, is what we use when we don't feel like getting more facts or spending more time. We tend to use intuition when we're being a little bit lazy, let's just say. And they are not the same things. We can prove that humans are uniquely good at judgment and that human judgment gets better over time with experience. We can also, by the way, experimentally prove that humans, the human intuition in particular, is not much better than chance. Well, if human intuition is not much better than chance, and I can point you to some studies about how you can prove this yourself, then I can program a computer to use intuition, right? Because I can program a computer to flip a coin. So the answer to the question is, what do we automate? What do we give to the computers boils down to this. Give to the machines everything that doesn't require human judgment and take from the machines everything that does. So maybe the machine is very good at telling me, say we were you know, in a court of law, maybe a machine would be very good at telling me if a photograph has been doctored, has been altered in some way. But that doesn't mean that we should allow the machine to tell us what to think of that information, what verdict, say, to have in a trial. That is an issue of judgment. Okay, I don't think any of that's going to be super controversial. Sometimes when I talk to people, however, the, the next couple of things can, you know, can be a little iffy. And this might be an area where we talk in questions. I will say to you that based on what we have just said before, that a goal of perfection, uh, zero errors, 100% success, is not only unrealistic, it is counterproductive. It is damaging. So my argument goes like this. There is no system ever created by human beings, no mechanical system, no computing system, no economic system, no political system, no system ever created in the history of human beings that has been perfect, that has been 100% successful or had no errors. That is not terribly uh, unusual to think of because I don't think anyone could name me a system in nature that is the same too. Human beings are the product of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, millennia of evolution. But still, uh, when our genes copy, they copy with mistakes. So even that process, which has been refined over millennia, makes mistakes all the time. Well, if nature doesn't build perfect systems, and it does not, uh, and if we have time later, I can explain to you why the sun is not an example of a perfect system, then it's not reasonable to think that humans will. In fact, we might say that it is inhumane, right? Because it denies the essence of humanity. This is right what Seneca and Pope and others have said. But it's worse than that. Your users do not need perfection. In fact, they will not notice perfection. So when you pursue perfection, to the extent that you are pursuing it past the point at which your users will notice it, you are wasting time and effort. And each marginal unit of improvement, by the way, is exponentially more expensive than the previous one. So you're wasting opportunity just to stand still for a thing your users won't care about. And not only that, because it's not achievable, eventually, if you grade people on a scale of perfection, you will create dishonesty. 
So my first job at Google was to build Google Cloud support. And I'd never built a support team before. It was fine. Uh, and one of our original goals, because I didn't know any better, um, is we had a goal of 100% customer satisfaction. And in the beginning, it was fine because as we got better, customers got more satisfied. Yay. But then we got to a, an asymptote over which we could not reasonably improve. And what we started to notice, which thankfully we noticed early and corrected quickly, is because people couldn't get, couldn't really achieve better than, let's say, 95% customer satisfaction, they would start unintentionally doing things like only sending customer surveys to customers they thought would be happy, which is a lie, even if it's an unconscious lie. You will turn your employees and the people you work with and the people in your life into liars, into dishonest people if you expect perfection from them. So the good news is, is no user of any system demands perfection. No computing system you build needs to be perfect, period, end of story, because you don't have users using it all the time, or the, or the path between you and your user is imperfect. The phone they are using is not perfect. The networks they are on is not perfect, et cetera, et cetera. You only need to be as good as the least perfect thing that sits between you and your user. And in fact, there is a magic line, and it is truly magic because it has this wonderful property. When you are under the magic line, your customers will be unhappy and they will tell you. But the minute you get over the magic line, they will become indifferent. So we did this exercise as we were building cloud support. As our systems got more reliable, our customer satisfaction improved. No big surprise. But then at a certain level of improvement, customer satisfaction did not increase. There was a very steep knee at the top of that curve. And the reason is, is because our customers couldn't perceive the difference, even though each marginal increase uh, was very much more expensive. And so it turned out to be a waste of time to chase anything better than that. And the good news is, is there's hardly any system on the planet where you can't get user feedback. So you can use data to judge where this line is. Um, so a well-run business, a well-run system, people who are doing their job well, aim to run just a little bit above this magic line. Not a lot above it and certainly not below it. Just a teeny tiny bit, excuse me, above it. So, okay. We have perfection, which we know we're not supposed to chase. We have this magic line above which our users are indifferent. Uh, we need to, to name this space between how good you really need to be and perfect. Um, so we have a name for this uh, in SRE. It's called the error budget. It's a name I love because the principle of the error budget says we should treat that level of acceptable imperfection as a budget. We should spend it. So. Obviously, if you consistently overspend your error budget, it means you are consistently under your magic line, which means you have consistently unhappy users. That's bad. You don't want that because, again, it's not reliable. They won't trust it. They won't use it. You'll soon have no users. But if you consistently underspend your error budget, if you are consistently above your magic line, then you are wasting opportunities to learn, to experiment, to invest in other areas. You are standing still you will be paralyzed and not be able to innovate. And then guess what? Your users won't use your systems anymore either. And so the magic of running a system is finding the magic line and managing your error budget. Uh, we're going to dig into this, but I need to define just a couple more terms because we use them uh, all the time in SRE. The first term is called a service level indicator, an SLI. A service level indicator is a thing that we measure that tells us how our users are experiencing our system. So we might measure, say, the latency, how long a request, a popular request takes in our system. Uh, and, and we'd usually be more formal. We would say something like um, the latency of this request at its 95th percentile measured over five minute buckets. It's usually like some value at a percentile over an interval. But the point is, though, it's from a from the user's perspective. It's a metric the user cares about. That's a good SLI. Latency, request latency is a good SLI. A bad SLI would be something like CPU load. Zero percent of your users care about CPU load. What they care about is, you know, the effect of a high CPU load. Like, what does it do to latency? That's an SLI, a service level indicator. The next term is an SLO, a service level objective. Basically, is that's the value we want our SLI to be when we measure it. 
right? So if we're measuring latency, so we say we're measuring the latency of a certain popular request in our system at the 95th percentile over five minute intervals. Okay, that's our SLI. Now we give it a target. And when we measure it in those parameters, we want it to be less than or equal to 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds now is our SLO. It is our objective. And now we have a formal name for our magic line. The magic line is the SLO, the service level objective. It is the bar of reliability. Again, keeping in mind, reliability encompasses a bunch of terms where if you are under it, you are underperforming for your users. And if you are over it, you are underperforming for your company because you're wasting resources. I should say very quickly, uh, SLIs and SLOs have the uh, unfortunate uh, property of sharing two letters with another term called an SLA, a service level agreement. Um, they mostly don't relate to one another. An SLA, a service level agreement, is a, is a contract. It's a promise you make to your customer that says if you don't meet certain conditions in a contract, they have some kind of financial remediation. It's done by lawyers and sometimes sales and marketing people. If we lived in a perfect world, an SLA would be your SLO plus a small buffer, you know, and, and, and plus some consequences. Uh, but an SLA is almost never that. So for the purposes of this conversation and most of the conversations you'll have around reliability, um, other than just making sure your SLAs aren't insane, like they're really out of line with what your SLOs are, you'll leave, you won't really look at your SLAs. Uh, they are external. Your SLOs and your SLIs are internal. Okay. So we know we can't be perfect. Uh, we, we can talk about uh, what that, how much imperfection is permissible, the error budget. We, we use some terms to define those magic lines. What do we do when we have when we have too much perfection, when we blow our error budget? Okay, uh, well, we, we've talked about like what, a little bit why it's a bad idea to underspend your error budget because you're wasting time and money and resources, but what do you do when you overspend it? Now, keep in mind, reliability is your most important feature. So if you have become less reliable than your customers need or expect, it becomes your most important thing, period. More important than everything else, to fix that and, and get back in their good graces, let's say, get back on path. So the easiest thing to do when you blow an error budget is a feature freeze. And it's the thing I always recommend people start with. Let's, let's work a, a concrete example here. Suppose we have a budget of 10 errors per every 30 days and we push a change that accidentally causes 20 errors. Okay, we've now spent two months of budget or, or 60 days of budget in a, you know, for what was a 30 day budget. We've overspent by 30 days. So what are we going to do for 30 days while we recover budget? Obviously, we're going to fix whatever mistake it was that caused us to, to overspend our error budget so that we can not spend any more. We're going to freeze new features, meaning we're going to stop developing code uh, for, for features. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to spend our time working on things that improve the reliability of our system. So for example, it might be we pushed a change, and the reason we blew our error budget is we didn't notice in time. We didn't notice this was a problem until our users started complaining to us. Well, then maybe we'll spend a good chunk of those 30 days building tighter monitoring, like watching our systems more closely, building automation to do that. It might be we noticed, but we didn't have a good way to roll back the change we rolled out. Or, or actually, let's try an easier one. That we noticed, but we rolled out changes too quickly so that the, the blast radius, the impact radius of the change got too wide too fast. So now maybe we'll spend our time building progressive rollouts. Or maybe we, we, we noticed it, but we didn't have a good way to roll back the change. That's true in a lot of systems. So maybe we need to spend that 30 days building automated rollbacks. The point is, is that if you get into this mode where when you blow your error budget, when you overspend your error budget, you freeze for the amount of time it takes for you to recover the error budget, which is just arithmetic, and focus all of your time on the reliability aspects of your system, you are less likely to blow your error budget next time because the mistakes that you make will have a smaller blast radius. The important thing about this is you need to have a, a, this policy, whatever it's going to be, in place before the bad thing happens. Because then people aren't arguing in the middle of an, you know, of an emergency about what to do. It's just math. We know what to do. We fix it. And then we focus on how we improve it. So that's all fine. But it's not by itself good enough. If you really want to embrace your humanity by embracing your imperfection, it's not enough to have an error budget. You also have to, to think about how you talk about these things internally. The first thing to understand is it is basically never true that it's not your fault. And here's what I mean. 
let's take a real example. Uh, today, uh, Twitter had a large global outage. Lots of very smart people at Twitter who work really hard. So let's take a hypothetical example. Suppose the problem, and I don't know what the problem is, but suppose the problem was is they had a big problem with their database. Just, I, I don't know, but let's pretend. And you're a front-end developer. Like you're a web developer. You don't work on the database. You might be tempted to say, I don't work on the database. It's not my fault. It's the fault of some dependency that I have. Well, I'd like to point out two things. Number one, your customer, your user, does not care. Nobody who uses Twitter today cares whose fault it is, which part of the stack failed. They just, it doesn't matter to them. The second thing to point out is it's almost never true that there's nothing you can do. So in our hypothetical, let's say you were the front-end web developer and your stuff's all working fine. We're going to put that in finger quotes. But you depend on a database that just wasn't there for you at some point. You need to ask yourself a question. Could I insert a caching layer? in front of that database so that I could serve old data? Could I uh, fail gracefully in some way? Could I put some caching into the front end UI layer for my user? Like there, are, there's always something you can do. So the first cultural sort of thing, corporate cultural thing to get over is, is it's everyone's fault. Like there's something everybody in the entire serving path can do to make their bit uh, less dependent on whatever broke. That having been said, it's very important that we do not blame humans ever. This is an important cultural thing we have at Google. Whenever bad things happens, we don't blame humans. We just don't. All right, so let me give you a hypothetical. Let's suppose we have a, a poor, unlucky human. His name is Adam. And he's walking in a data center and he trips over a power cable. And he trips over the cable and the server that's sitting in the rack comes flying out of the rack, goes, you know, smashes into a million pieces against the wall. And unfortunately, that server was running some user-facing service. So now that user-facing service is down. So we've got Adam who tripped over the cable. So we might say, oh, it's Adam's fault. He should have watched where he was going. Or we might say, you know, it turns out the server was installed by, I don't know, Betty, and she didn't screw in all the mounting screws. And if she had screwed in all the mounting screws, you know, that wouldn't happen. Maybe it's Betty's fault. Or we might say, hey, there's, uh, there's Charlie and his service was only running on that one machine, his user-facing service. Like Charlie should have been running on more than one machine. So it's his fault. Or maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe we, you know, we can say Danielle is the front-end web developer and her UI was relying on Charlie's service to, to, to talk to customers. And maybe it didn't cache data or fail gracefully. So maybe it's her fault. Like whose fault is it? The answer is it's the system's fault. That's the most important thing. It's the system's fault. When you blame humans, they do not honestly share what went wrong and, and what, say, mistakes that they made. And therefore, you do not learn. And when you have a customer-facing error, that's like an investment. You have just lost some user trust. It's a sunk cost. It is gone. So now you have to get as much value from that investment as you possibly can. And the way to get value from that investment is to learn as much as you can. And the way you do that is that people are honest. When you blame systems, people will make the system better. Humans will make mistakes. You should not say, Adam made a mistake, Betty made a mistake, it's Charlie's fault, it's Danielle's fault, whoever. No, no. We say, Adam was the unlucky human who happened to get caught this time because he happened to trip over the power cable. We should ask, why did the system allow a power cable to be on the data center floor? Why did the racks that we buy allow someone, you know, require screws, why not snaps? Why does the software system allow someone to singly home a backend service on one machine? Why does the UI framework that we use not have data caching or graceful degradation built right into it? We don't blame the people, we blame the system. And in fact, if you really wanna do this, you go one step further. You celebrate your biggest failures, your biggest mistakes, and most critically, your biggest near misses. So this is the thing, you know, we happen to do at Google. Twice a year, we have our performance uh, uh, review uh, season, and we, um, we look for people who pushed out, say, a bad config that caused an outage. They raised their hand. They helped fix it. They wrote a good detailed postmortem. They did a good design doc for how to make the system less likely to have this problem in the future for the next unlucky person. We go, we find those people twice a year during uh, performance season, and we promote them. 
whether they ask for it or not. And we bring them on stage at our weekly all hands, whenever we're allowed to do that again, called TGIF. And they talk about this big thing that they went through. It's a really important cultural thing for us. And I think it should be for you too, to reinforce to people, people are just the unlucky victims, bystanders of these mistakes that the system should not have allowed it. Last thing I want to say on this topic really quickly is that reliability and speed are not natural enemies of one another. If you do these things, if you operate with a narrow budget with really well-defined SLOs that are connected to business values, if you have a good plan for what to do when you blow the error budget, if you have a good plan for recognizing when you're underspending your error budget, what you will find is that as you adopt these things, your reliability and your speed, your velocity increase at the same time because error budgets align the people who are concerned with risk with the people who are concerned with speed. So maybe in your company, the feature developers want to go really fast and the operations people who have the pagers want to go really slow because they care about the reliability. An error budget puts everyone on the same page. And by the way, you could use an error budget to align any two groups that seem misaligned against speed versus risk. Like I have personally used error budgets to get lawyers uh, and marketing people to align on a path forward, which means you have happier engineers happier customers, and higher customer satisfaction. And by the way, you will not be able to escape these principles. Like, this isn't just some sort of lofty religion I'm coming from a mountaintop to preach. This is all hard-learned lessons. As your systems grow, you will have to adopt things like this. Otherwise, you won't be prepared as you grow. Uh, I think many of you are probably familiar with the uh, expression, good luck's what happens when opportunity meets preparation. Eliyahu Goldratt, uh, had a great expression, which I always loved, where he said, uh, good luck is when opportunity meets preparation, but bad luck is when lack of preparation meets reality. And here's the interesting thing. Our systems have global users and they have a lot of moving parts, which means they have emergent behavior, which means it's not enough to have a good rollout process. It's not enough to have a good rollback process in tight monitoring. That's not enough. Our system is going to evolve behaviors we did not specifically design into it. And we will find out, all things being equal, we will find out about those behaviors uh, badly when our users tell us, usually in the form of support tickets or, you know, whatever, blog posts. That's bad. We don't want that. This is where a, a system like chaos engineering comes in because we can use things like fault injection or artificial resource constriction or fuzz testing or randomized load swings, laser beaming, to carefully but consciously probe the edges of our systems to see uh, which emergent properties they may have uh, created for themselves with it before we learned. I, I like to look at it this way. This is my uh, unbelievably succinct and probably incorrect definition of what chaos engineering is. Since we use the principles of chaos engineering to discover emergent properties because the presence of emergent properties creates lack of preparation or bad luck for using gold rods, Definition, to me, chaos engineering, my unnecessarily compact definition, is it is a discipline for, system, for systematically minimizing bad luck, like making sure we are actually as prepared as we think we are in the systems that we are running. And by the way, I don't just mean our computing systems. I also mean our people systems. Companies, collections of humans are distributed systems. So I'm an engineer. I like analogies, but I, I hate to tell this to you. This is not an analogy. This is a truth. It's a fact. Companies are actually distributed systems where humans are the nodes. And almost all the complexity in any company of greater than, say, three people comes from the human beings, not from the software that you design. The real complexity is with the people. And the reason is, and it gets back to our first slide, Humans make well-intentioned mistakes, even when they're not trying to. Humans look a lot like a fairly opaque microservice that is only partially reliable. This, by the way, is an analogy, um, but I think a pretty useful one. We are these semi-autonomous units of execution. We have inconsistent inputs and outputs, op opaque system internals. We're basically buggy biological microservices. Ask a person to do the simplest thing, like raise their left hand, and you can be sure that like 20% of them are going to do it wrong consistently as a distribution. Um, and you shouldn't feel bad about it because it is the definition of who we are. All right. 
So I know I want to keep this to about 45 minutes and I'm looking at like, I'm at like 34 or 35 minutes. So, and I did promise you that by the end of this uh, sort of uh, uh, whatever diatribe presentation, that I would tell you the secret universal secret to happiness and success in life in two sentences. And so I want to be honest and I want to do that. Gentle people uh, of, of agile India, here is the secret to happiness and success in life in two easy to follow sentences. You ready? Number one, it is no sin to fail. Do not live your life worrying about whether the thing you are going to do is going to fail. The sin is failing to notice. Rather than spending your time trying to do meticulous planning to make sure the thing you are trying to do does not fail, you're much better off spending your time contingency planning. How quickly can I notice that this thing that I want to do is not behaving the way I want it to? It's failing, not meeting my goal. How can I adjust? How can I limit the blast radius? How can I roll it back? How can I mitigate it? If you spend all of your planning or you know, on that, rather than being paralyzed with this notion that you're going to fail, what it means is, is you can fail a lot more. When the blast radius of your mistakes goes asymptotically to zero, the amount of risk you can take goes asymptotically towards infinity. Oh, I guess I should say asymptotically towards infinity. That's not strictly mathematically correct. But how about really, really high? It's essentially one over zero. Um, and that's the secret. The secret is not paralyzing yourself with a fear of failure. The secret is contingency planning so that you notice quickly, learn quickly, and adjust and adapt. So... We're at like uh, 36 minutes of a 45-minute presentation, and I wanted to leave roughly 10 minutes for Q&A, so we're kind of on time. Uh, now is your opportunity for pitchforks and bullhorns and torches and all the things people like to do during Q&A. Uh, and I think Naresh is going to maybe read the Q&A to me so I don't have to go find it in the UI. Yep. Thank you for yep. being, by the way, a very attentive audience. Wow, what an amazing start of the day. Thank you, uh, Dave. This is just mind-blowing. Uh, love the perspective on uh, error budget. I think that's such a powerful thing. Of course, your last slide on uh, the two sentences that will make you infinitely happy or successful, uh, of course, is mind-blowing. But I think the error budget, I think, is, is something I'm going to steal from your talk. Uh, very, very powerful way to... Uh, you know, get two groups to align. I think that was really powerful. So thanks a lot. And you can see the light cloud uh, over here. Uh, and it's just raining uh, likes. I'm glad. Uh, the first question is from Sunil. Uh, and Sunil is asking, is artificial intelligence likely to take over human judgment by your definition? No, but I do think it is likely to... Ne Thank you for the question, Sunil. No, I, I think it is going to narrow the range of things we think are judgment. But no, I, fundamentally, computers can't do judgment. They're, they're deterministic. Even if the contents of the black box are unknown to us, they're still deterministic systems. Uh, and judgment is, is non-deterministic. That's why it is judgment. This is a lot like the argument about, we thought a machine was intelligent if it could play chess and beat a grandmaster. And it did. Um, but we still don't think machines are truly intelligent. We thought a machine is intelligent, perhaps, if it can uh, create art, like music. And machines are beginning to do that. But we still don't really think of machines as intelligent. What it's really doing is just sort of asymptotically refining the edges of the places where we were previously using judgment but don't need to. Perfect. Uh, the next question is kind of, uh, you know, piggybacking on that uh, from Ashok, where he says, when you, uh, when you say prefer human beings over computers, for judgment work, uh, I understand that fully auto uh, uh, autonomous uh, machines is not a good idea. Is my understanding right? Yes, that is, that is, yes, that is, you have a correct understanding. Great. The next question is from Ruchi. Uh, she's asking, uh, sometimes while building a system, requirements go uh, goes missing or not captured correctly. For this scenario, would it be incorrect to question a human involved in capturing requirement? How can the system be held responsible for this? Ah, well, you should ask the question this way, Ruchi. Let's assume that um, 
Dave that I'm the product manager and I did a poor job of defining the requirements. The question you should ask is, why do we have a system, a product development system or process at the company that allows a person like Dave to accidentally miss an important set of requirements? Like, is there something we can do so that the next unlucky Dave um, doesn't miss an important requirement in the definition process? Right. You don't want to say Dave is bad at his job. I mean, it might be true that I'm bad at my job and that's a different kind of a question. But overall, unless we are terrible at hiring at our company, uh, I or the other product managers aren't likely to be bad at our job. But we are definitely likely to be human and miss important things. And so rather than rather than go to the product manager and say, come to me and say, Dave, there's this important thing that you just missed. You should come to me and say, I notice that this requirement that seems important is not in the definition. I'm curious for your opinion what is it about the requirements definition system that permitted this gap to exist? And is that working as intended? That asks me, that encourages me to be introspective without being accusatory. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, makes total sense. Uh, thanks for that. The next question again is from Sunil. Uh, he's asking, uh, let me quickly uh, scroll here. So he's asking, is there a need for perfection that is zero defect for uh, places like medical software where lives are at stake? No. Um, in fact, if you go look, I did research on this three or four years ago because when I was hired at Google, uh, one of the people who interviewed me is a guy named Ben Trainer Sloss. He invented SRE. He's the subject matter expert on the topic in the world. And Ben liked to say, you don't need perfection unless you're doing something like a pacemaker for a heart, which I think we'd agree is a fairly vital system. And I thought, well, I believe for real that humans can't be perfect and therefore no system of human designs can be perfect. Are pacemakers perfect? Like, am I wrong? So I went and looked. The average pacemaker has a, a, a reliability of about four nines. It's, it's much less than 100%. It's about four nines, um, meaning... 99.99% uh, of the time, when your heart has an arrhythmia, the pacemaker will detect it and correct it correctly. But that other time, it will not. But you know what? That turns out to be acceptable because even a very fragile human heart uh, can tolerate that level of error. And that's good because if a pacemaker or some other piece of medical equipment had to be perfect, there would never be new medical equipment because we'd never be done testing it. Um, so the answer is no, not even medical software or medical equipment has to be perfect because A, it never is. But B, even the most life-sensitive stuff is nowhere near perfect. Great. Uh, the next question is from Sakshi. Uh, organizations these days continuously focus on target zero defect delivery. Uh, this has a great impact on sales as well as customer finding it fancy. Uh, what would you suggest as an alternative marketing strategy uh, or a market strategy, sorry, uh, and how could the mindset of such organizations be changed? Sure. Um, so uh, let me do that in reverse order. The way to change the mindset of an organization like that is to point out to them that never in the history of the organization have they actually delivered zero defects. And if they think they have delivered zero defects, then they're lying to themselves, usually by mis by let's say unintentionally mismeasuring. Usually it's intentionally mismeasuring, but whatever, right? That's the first thing they have to come to grips with is it's, they're making a promise they cannot keep and an honest person will hold them to account for it and like they'll get sued. It's terrible. You don't want to do that. Um, I find it useful in life to think about the things as a collection of optimizations and constraints. So a system, any system can only be optimized for one thing at a time but it can be subject to a bunch of constraints. So what I would say is, in that case, the number of permissible defects or the reliability of the system is a constraint because it has to meet a certain bar but not be above it. And what you optimize for, that's say what you market against, are the shiny new awesome features of the system. It does new awesome thing X, it does new great thing Y, it gives you new capability Z, and when you need it to work, it's going to be there and work for you, which is not a specific promise promise around defects. But if you're promising zero defects, you're promising zero mistakes. That's a lie. It's an actual lie. You're being dishonest with customers. And no company that does that will will have customers for very long. Great. Uh, I know we are overshooting a little bit with the time, but there's just so many interesting questions 
uh, and uh, I, I, I'm thinking we we'll, uh, just spend another five minutes, if that's okay with you, Dave. Totally fine with me. I, I leave it entirely to you. All right, awesome. Uh, so the next question is from Ankit, and uh, his question is: seven out of ten is probably what is acceptable, or uh, he's just uh, using a number like seven out of ten is probably acceptable, or what is required to reach uh, from seven to uh, uh, what is required to reach from seven to ten to nine to ten would need probably some effort that uh, was needed to reach uh, at the you know much more effort to reach seven to ten. So then what derives, uh, what drives people or company to make that extra effort that won't even matter at the end and the cost that uh, cost them huge cost slash effort. All right. Well, look, first, that's an excellent observation. Let me, yeah, it's, it's super linear. Uh, say it's exponential. Uh, let me give you a good rule of thumb. Every nine you want to add to a system, say we're talking about availability, but it doesn't matter. So if I want to go from three nines, 99.9% available. If I want to add that fourth nine, go to 99.99% available, will cost me 10x, not just 10x development cost, 10x ongoing operations cost. Therefore, adding two more nines will be 100x, three nines, 1,000x, et cetera, et cetera. It's roughly 10x super linear. That's a good rule of thumb. Um, the answer is companies say they want to pursue it because it, it seems ideal to them and like it should be attractive and they don't really do the math about the cost. I would argue that very, very, very few companies who say they want to make that incremental improvement, you know, get asymptotically close to 10 over time, actually legitimately invest the effort to do it. They just say they're going to and, and either fudge the metrics or don't really hold people accountable or whatever. Um, and that, by the way, that's not okay. Any of those outcomes are not okay. It's not okay to, to not deliver the, the promise you're making to your customer. It's not okay to fudge the metrics because now you're flying blind in your business. Uh, it's not okay to tell people you're going to hold them accountable and then not hold them accountable. That's a bad precedent to set in the business, like other uh, bad behaviors happen because of it. So I think a lot of companies pay lip service to that sort of improvement and then don't actually really invest in it. I, in fact, I think most companies don't even really do the math to ask the hard question, what would it take to really make that progress? Um, and so it's like an empty promise that they think people aren't going to hold them to. And maybe that's true, because after all, humans don't have expectations of perfection. So maybe they know it's, you know, kind of a kind of a lie in a sense. But I still think it's a terrible way to run a business because it just creates awful inefficiencies at a, at a minimum. Well, very well said. The next question kind of is similar from Ujwal. Uh, does that mean if we need to design an application with an expectation of 99.9% availability uh, or, uh, you know, uh, handling X number of uh, concurrent users uh, per day, uh, we have been drawing the wrong expectations right from the onset? Well, it's hard to say. Um, for a new system, it's hard to know what line you need to draw. Um, but remember, these t you can design these things, you can ratchet these things in two directions. So here's the good news. No matter how long it takes you to design a system, if the system is at all successful, um, the amount of effort and time you spend operating the system will easily overwhelm the design and, and implementation time, right? And if it doesn't, if that's not true, then you have a short-lived system and it's not even worth discussing because it's been an unsuccessful system. So if it takes you a year and a hundred people to design a system for, for four nines and you're going to operate it for 10 years, let's say I'm making these numbers up, of course, you can begin to measure. So let's say you really do design it to be, uh, I forget if you said three or four nines, let's say four nines just for, for math, for four nines and you deploy it and it really is four nines. Cool. First of all, are you stably there? Okay, you are. Great. And are users complaining to you? No, they're not. Okay. It's time to experiment. It's time to test. Is, our, is this exactly the right error budget? So let's start taking a little more risk in the system and see if we go from four nines to maybe three and a half nines and see what happens. By the way, that'll happen anyway. You'll have outages. Um, so whether you do it as a natural experiment or a conscious experiment, you should proactively introduce error into the system a little bit, not a lot, of, but just a little bit to start to ratchet it down a little bit and start to collect some samples. And you might find that you get all the way to two and a half nines or three nines before you start to see a lot of customer complaints. 
okay, now you're starting to circle around where your SLO should be. We didn't talk about this in the presentation, but when for a new system, you should be evaluating your air budget and SLOs. Like, do I have the right SLO? At least once a quarter. Because you just, you don't know. And so it might be okay to over-engineer in the beginning because yes, will that have been wasted effort for the engineering? It will. But remember, all the costs over the long tail are going to be in the operation of the system, not in the engineering of it. So you want to play during the operations to find the right line. Right. Great. Uh, the last question we'll take and then we'll try and wrap up uh, here. I know it's late for you, Dave. So thanks and uh, thanks again for hanging in there. So this question right. is from Pallavi. Uh, she's asking, understand, the, uh, uh, understand contingency planning is important. But however, I've seen examples of con uh, con contingency planning uh, beaten to death. How to balance this or is it required to stop somewhere? Like where do you draw the line? Yeah, so um, I use a rule of N plus two, uh, which is to say I have a plan. Okay, now I stack rank all the ways I think it can fail. And I take, say, the first, you know, five of them and I plan for those. And then in that part of the tree, the next layer down, right? So I've ignored, let's say I find 100 ways it could fail. I take the top five. So I'm ignoring the other 95. And then in the next layer of the tree, where I'm underneath those five, I ask, well, given that failure in this mitigation, how could that fail? And I do that, you know, for another, say, five things. So now I've planned two layers deep on my top five things. That's my rule of thumb. That's enough contingency planning. Most contingency planning shouldn't take more than about a month. Uh, in most systems. Uh, if it takes a lot longer than that, you're either doing too much or you don't really understand how you expect your system to work. But I agree, you can absolutely over-engineer your contingency planning. Uh, so my rule of thumb is two layers deep on your top five things. Uh, and that is, in my experience, almost always enough. I'll sneak in one last question, sorry. Uh, I think this is a good one. Sure. Uh, this is from Madhrin. Uh, to determine the magic line, we should need to get customer feedback. Uh, we would need to get customer feedback. However, minority of customers may uh, may be asking for a perfect system. Uh, so, you know, we, we, to determine the magic line, we need to get customer feedback. However, minority of customers uh, may, uh, may be asking for a perfect system. Is there a rule we can apply to determine which customer feedback gets ignored? Um, so... Two things. It's actually, well, it's not my experience that customers expect perfection. They, they expect the system to meet their, uh, well, their expectation, and they almost never expect perfection. But let's, let's assume for the sake of the question that your, your, uh, that your hypothesis, you know, whatever, your, your thesis is, we'll just accept that. So, so question is minority of the customers are actually asking. I understand. So oh, okay. your goal is not to have zero complaints. That isn't the goal. The goal is to find the tipping point between a consistent trickle of complaints, say 1% of complaints or something, and where the step function is where the 1% becomes 10%. That's where the magic line is. You will never have zero complaints. It just doesn't matter. Even people who don't demand perfection will misunderstand how the system is supposed to work and therefore will complain right? Or just misread something like all of those things were going to happen. So you're never going to have zero complaints. So you can treat the people who want perfection as kind of the background noise of complaint you'll have no matter what. That's irrelevant to your business because it's not practical anyway. They're asking for a thing you can't deliver. What you want to find is where does it spike? That's where the magic line is. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I see the thumbs up. So I think people are happy with that answer. All right, fantastic. I think, uh, Dave, this was uh, a, a really, really brilliant way to start the day. Thank you so much for the, sharing your uh, insights with us. Uh, and thank you very much, Dave, again, for joining us. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, thank everyone. You.